Hello, and welcome to Middleside Topwise. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank Rockstar Games for considering me for the role of cinematic artist at Rockstar Dundee back in 2022. It was exciting just to be considered, and I would have been both a dedicated worker and vocal workers' rights advocate. When we talk about the creation of art under capitalism, the first thing that usually comes to mind is film. For centuries, individuals have written songs and crafted sculptures or paintings that are then observed by millions. But motion pictures in particular cannot exist without many hours of labor performed by dozens, if not hundreds of people. All of these laborers are underpaid, if they're paid at all, and are often horribly mistreated for the sake of the director's creative vision. As with all goods, the product of this massive collaboration is then commodified by capitalists, with the creators usually receiving a small fraction of the profits. The only anti-capitalist film ever made is Clerks by Kevin Smith, and even he had to sell it to Miramax for anyone to actually see it. But let's posit the idea that, despite this being a clearly exploitative industry, stories can still be told that criticize and ultimately reject the mainstream capitalist narrative. For example, we have a movie like The Matrix, which had a budget of $63 million and has grossed nearly $500 million worldwide since its release in 1999. This film, written by two trans women and heavily influenced by Grant Morrison's anarchist graphic novel The Invisibles, is one of the most commodified pieces of media on the planet. I can't even show a clip of it without being hit with a copyright strike. Trust me, I've tried. So, does Warner Brothers Discovery's conglomerate ownership of the Matrix negate the profoundly subversive messages within? I mean, maybe it does. Maybe everything created under capitalism is tainted, and that's why people gravitate towards the obscure and the underground in search of truth. Maybe we need to re-examine how we consider people's basic needs, so subcultures can properly gestate and evolve, leading to a richer, more creative society. Some might suggest that this would lead to laziness, but in the world of unbridled creativity that only a select few currently experience, artists of all disciplines willingly choose to put in hours well above the standard 40-hour work week in order to manifest their vision. Shit, I'm putting in multiple 12-hour days just to get this video finished, and I'm broke. Join our Patreon for exclusive videos and Discord access. When discussing why she chose not to participate in the intentional parody that was The Matrix Resurrections, Lily Wachowski explains that after multiple 100-day shoots in a single year, she was exhausted and needed to practice self-care. Similarly, in 2018, Rockstar Games co-founder and writer of Red Dead Redemption 2, Dan Hauser, said, We were putting in 100-hour weeks to get the game finished. This sent shockwaves through the industry about the studio's work-life balance, and after an extended break, Hauser would leave the company in early 2020. In 2024, Rockstar is once again facing scrutiny after mandating a return to the office, causing the Independent Workers' Union of Great Britain to come out in support of employees. Head of publishing Jennifer Colby said it's for both security and productivity reasons, but many see it as part of the recent wave of layoffs seen across the gaming industry. Are long office hours a requirement for great art? Or are developers being overworked for the sake of performative productivity? Let's get into it. In 2008, less than a month after the release of GTA 4, Actor Michael Hollick was interviewed by the New York Times and spoke very frankly about his compensation for the lead role of Nico Balik. Paid just over $1,000 a day for voice and motion capture work over a 15-month period, he says his request for residuals during negotiation was denied, but blames the union for not creating a better scenario for video game talent. An opposing perspective is provided in the article by entertainment lawyer Ezra Donner, who said in regards to actor pay, they fit into the general food chain of the media business. If they can negotiate a big fee for themselves, great. If not, that's too bad. Okay. In 2009, Rockstar San Diego would settle out of court for $2.75 million in a class action lawsuit that claimed they failed to pay overtime to over 100 3D artists. In 2010, an anonymous group calling themselves the Determined Devoted Wives of Rockstar San Diego Employees released a statement concerning worker conditions. 
It's kind of funny that a game about being forced to labor endlessly while your family is held hostage brings up questions about worker mistreatment. This prompted a response from the International Game Developers Association, and soon after, MTV released an interview with a former Rockstar NYC staffer who backed up their words, reporting long hours with last-minute demands and no direction, opposed to any other studio where there are regular meetings and milestones so you don't get too far down a path before people come in to make sweeping changes. The source then referred to the New York office executives as unstable and needy and compared them to the Eye of Sauron. In response, Rockstar would send out an internal letter amounting to an elaborate nuh -uh, offering no real data in regards to wage increases or ancillary benefits, and posted this wallpaper of an eye overlooking popular San Diego monuments on their website. The company then posted an incredibly condescending message suggesting unhappy employees find an environment more suitable to their temperaments and needs, going on to say that, the vast majority of our company are focused solely on delivering cutting-edge interactive entertainment. This would all serve as lead-up to the release of Red Dead Redemption, a game that was in production for six years due to horrible management and lack of direction due to fear of disrespecting Rockstar NY, and was not expected to make its money back. It was the fifth highest selling game of 2010, selling 5.2 million copies in just three weeks about three times the number needed to break even. Two months after RDR's successful release, Rockstar San Diego laid off 40 full-time workers. Later that year, a blogger going by the name Zero Dean posted My Life at Rockstar Games, expounding upon many of the Rockstar Wives' claims, including an increase in hours without pay, deteriorating morale, and aggressive chastising from upper management. Smash cut to 2018, and the Red Dead curse rears its ugly head once again. When discussing last-minute rewrites of Red Dead Redemption 2 with New York Magazine, Dan Hauser infamously said, We were putting in 100-hour weeks. When asked to clarify, Hauser said that he was referring to the senior writing team only over the course of a few weeks, and insisted that he did not expect anyone else to work that way. The thing is, major rewrites put hours of extra work on developers, and with the production of RDR2 pushing eight years, we begin to see that the culture of crunch spans a much longer period of time. A few days later, Kotaku posted an article that talked to 34 current and 43 former Rockstar employees, with almost all speaking anonymously. The common thread amongst them? The overall tone at Rockstar is that what the company values most is not the bugs you fix, but the hours you put in. Social media manager and ironically named Job Stauffer said that working for the company was like having a gun to your head seven days a week. Many more recount regular 70-hour weeks, with one RDR developer stating, We absolutely were forced to work six-day weeks in the six to nine months leading to launch. Shortly after that was the production of Max Payne 3, one of the only Rockstar games to not feature an open world, and was still described by staff as a death march. A former Rockstar New England staff member who was not compensated for extra hours worked instead hoped for a sizable bonus upon the game's release. These bonuses have been described as being in the mid-five digits for a successful game, which Max Payne 3 was not. One former Rockstar Toronto employee shared files from the GTA 5 era where those who worked fewer than 60 hours were marked with the word UNDER in red letters. Three individuals who worked for Rockstar San Diego between 2011 and 2016 described mandatory 80-hour weeks and were told to perform quality assurance tests for hours on end when they were out of tasks. If you're not familiar, QA is a job all on its own, and should not need to be performed by artists or other staff members. In an anonymous Reddit post, a Rockstar QA tester said, Overtime is not optional, it is expected, and that out of the 47 weeks they had worked for the company, a six-day week was the norm, clocking in a minimum of 48.75 hours per week. They also mentioned unpaid meal breaks, which added 7 to 11 hours of time spent at work. I'll also add that commute time was not included, but commonly takes another one to two hours and shouldn't be considered towards rest periods. In response, Jen Colby had the nerve to say, 
Through the conversations we've been having, it's clear to us that the requested scheduled overtime felt like an obligation to some, if not many, of the team. We therefore spoke to them to make sure it's clear that OT is not mandatory. Seeing this as a giant step forward, the Redditor also describes a situation where overtime is directly linked to job security and progression, with other QA testers in the comments reporting a typical six-month contract. Those who do not choose to work extra hours are simply not retained. Six current and former staff members, some of whom worked at multiple offices, independently used the phrase culture of fear in their correspondence. Even amongst the employees who had positive experiences, there were still concerns about unspoken rules at the company. Rockstar does have a pervasive issue with the appearance of work. They like seeing people at their desks, they don't allow work from home unless for medical reasons, and even then they strongly urge paid time off. They also like people staying for dinner, and you do see a bit of shame if you haven't stayed until dinner in a few weeks. Of course, all of this would change when the world attempted to go into lockdown to prevent the spread of the deadly autoimmune disease known as COVID-19. In 2023, 170 Rockstar Games workers in the UK signed a petition opposing a mandatory three-day return to the office that came with a promise from corporate. This isn't our first step to five days a week. No one wants to go back to the old way of working. Yeah, like, no, we no. get it. No one wants to go back yes, to that. that exactly. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, the slimy scumbags. Yeah. One year later, on February 28th, 2024, Rockstar announced a mandatory five-day return to office starting April 15th, citing security concerns and reduced productivity, and effectively disabling the remote access technology used by staff for the past four years. This prompted yet another letter from the IWGB that features quotes from affected workers. Working from home has been a lifeline for many of us at Rockstar allowing us to balance care responsibilities, manage disabilities, and relocate as we need. Now, Rockstar is snatching away that lifeline without a second thought for the workers who will be impacted most. Just one of my concerns is being forced to work late hours in the office to maintain contact with global teams, when before we could log on from home to attend late meetings. This will mean missing out on spending time with our families. I am also aware of colleagues who have health issues preventing full-time office work who are now left in limbo. Workers across the industry are done with letting executives make reckless and harmful decisions, and the Rockstar workers are showing us the start of what's to come if they're continually ignored. There's no better time than now to join our union and push for this to be the healthy and sustainable games industry we know it can be. It also cites a recent study on return to office mandates from the University of Pittsburgh School of Business that begins with this quote. The RTO push is eyewash for investors to prove that drops in revenue and profitability aren't a result of poor managerial decisions, but the result of lazy workers sitting at home in their pajamas. In some ways, it's a genius move for executives, a way to establish control over workers during an unprecedented societal awareness of labor rights. Thanks to the striking workers of the Writers Guild of America, SAG-AFTRA, and the United Auto Workers, while also shifting the blame and consequences of poor stock performances onto those least responsible. Following in the footsteps of Embracer Group, Riot Games, Microsoft, and Sony, Take-Two Interactive has canceled $140 million in projects and is set to lay off upwards of 600 people, or 5% of its staff across all subsidiaries by mid-2024. Some believe this is simply a tactic to make work unbearable or inaccessible and could potentially leave the company in shambles just as GTA 6 is being wrapped up. Another theory regarding RTO is that corporate property owners are losing money hand over fist and desperately need paying tenants to start using their giant skyscrapers again, or they're fucked. You know, corporate property owners like Starwood Property Trust, the commercial lending and investment firm that Strauss Zelnick has a major stake in. Strauss Zelnick also owns 99.71% of Take-Two Interactive, which is valued at $195 million. He signed on to be the CEO until 2029. In 2021, Take-Two made $1.65 billion on microtransactions from April to December alone. 
which kicked in Zelnik's recurrent consumer spending bonus, paying him over $15 million in 2022. In 2023, he made over $30 million. Starting in 2008, the Hauser brothers, and maybe some senior writing staff, have received royalty checks for game sales only. I could not find any data on anyone at Rockstar Games making money off of microtransactions. The point is, the developers are getting fuck all, and there's plenty of money to go around. In a world where new titles are often buggy, or just repackaged versions of last year's offering, it's refreshing to see a major game manufacturer take their time to create something special. But if most of that time is spent by disillusioned workers idling in cubicles trying to hit that 60 hour mark, the question must be asked, is it really worth it? Many employees who spoke negatively about their experience also said that they were proud to have worked on such revolutionary games, and that they did not see a way that these games could be made otherwise. If that really is the case, which I don't think it is, then the solution is to guarantee good pay and residuals to everyone involved with the game. Add a profit sharing clause to developer contracts, and watch worker productivity go through the roof. But to be perfectly honest, I think a lot of business owners just want slaves. As with all businesses, the problem starts and ends with bad management. Some jobs ain't for saving, and some legacies? Oh, they're for pissing off. Sam Hauser is the president of Rockstar Games in order to oversee the company's creative vision. He is not a manager. He takes orders from Strauss Zelnick. However, it is his obligation to find good management and to speak on behalf of his employees when Take-Two sends down directives that will impact them. Maybe Dan Hauser left the company because he was tired of dealing with this soulless corporate oversight, but who knows? Maybe he left because he's a hypocrite who practices the same ruthless capitalism that he criticizes in his stories, and doesn't give a shit about his workers. Either way, the actions of Rockstar Games do not take away from the fact that Grand Theft Auto is about, according to Forbes magazine, a corrupt capitalist hellscape where the American dream only exists if you lie, cheat, and steal your way to the top. Wait, wh where have I heard something like that before? For more on this topic, I highly recommend this April 2024 interview with former senior environmental artist Jonathan Gwynn on the Kiwi Talks podcast. Last time I checked, it has about 1,500 views, so I didn't want to spoil any of it. Go check it out. I don't want to diss them, but there, there's people there that um, have a very like aggressive managing style. And uh, they make so much money that there's really no incentive for them to change the way they do things. Good night and good luck.